So, Dr. Robert first, or Dr. Bob, welcome to Hallfield School. It's an enormous pleasure to have you here, uh, and you've flown in from Canada just to be with us this week. So, uh, you know, thank you so much. Is, is the first thing I want to say. Well, I, I want to say thank you to you for the invitation to to come to Hallfield. My first visit. Um, education of uh, young people is very important to me. When I was young, teachers made a difference to my life. And so at the end of my career now, I want to make sure that I do the same for the next generation that will follow us. Fantastic. So I'm here to talk to you about many things, but first of all, being an astronaut. So at what age did you decide uh, that's what you wanted to do, that was your dream, and you wanted to pursue that? I grew up during a phenomenal period of um, time for human civilization, the 1960s and the 1970s. Everything about society seemed to be moving and advancing so quickly back in those days, but in particular, uh, education, science, and the space program. In 1961, the first person flew in space. In 1969, two people walked on the moon. I was a child then, that caught my attention, and I learned everything that I could about this new realm that humans are venturing into called space, and I learned, learned as much as I could about this profession called astronaut. And uh, so, uh, without a doubt, the early astronauts influenced the direction that my educational path went, engineering, medicine, uh, and also my career path as, uh, as well. So I was very fortunate. To have, soon after I graduated from medical school, I was uh, hired, I was selected to become an astronaut with the Canadian Space Agency and I had the opportunity to fly twice in space. What did your parents say when you shared your ambition, said, look, you know, Mum, Dad, I, I'd like to be an astronaut? Did they, did they take you seriously or just tell you to think about getting a proper job? My parents were wonderful people. And, you know, in addition to, you know, the times that I grew up, without a doubt, it was a lot of the people that influenced me in um, the direction that my career went. And predominantly my, my parents. My father was a, a visionary who always encouraged me to pursue my, my interests and supported me as best uh, as they could in uh, pursuit of my dreams. My mother was a very uh, orderly, organized, administrative kind of person who uh, helped me once I identified a, a new passion, a new dream of, of mine. She'd help me put together a plan to help me uh, realize that, uh, that dream. So they were very fond of me when, whenever I, I mentioned a new thing that I was going to pursue, including uh, the space program. So, you know, there's not a whole lot that they can do to prepare me for a, such a unique um, career. There's a lot of education that I had to slug through myself, but they were there as moral support. Fantastic. So, university career, and then obviously you said you're selected for, for the space program. So, what does that training actually involve in terms of a daily basis, but also in terms of years of, of, of preparation? What, what, what does it look like, that program? In the early days of the human spaceflight program, all of the astronauts were, were similar. They were all men, they were all Caucasian, they were all pilots, they were all had a military background. But today, in today's era, um, the spectrum of work that we do in space today is, is broadened. So it's not just exploration, we also do scientific uh, research, we do repair work, we do assembly work as well. And that means that we select astronauts from a broader spectrum of vocation. So we select Military test pilots, yes, we do that, but also teachers and engineers and scientists and, and healthcare workers as, as well. What we need to do after we select this eclectic group of uh, new astronauts is give everyone basic training that takes everyone up to a common level of, um, of understanding of, uh, of space. So uh, in those first few years of flight, we will, uh, of training, we will uh, learn about the spaceship and all the systems that, that make up a spaceship. A spaceship is like an ecosystem. Everything is inter, interrelated, interdependent, so we have to learn about that. We have to learn basic skills like spacewalking and, and robotics and rendezvous and, and docking type of skills. A medical doctor is going to learn to fly a high-performance uh, aircraft, and a, a pilot astronaut is going to learn how to start an intravenous uh, line. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of training. Uh, and I guess in a nutshell, I would say that every person who becomes an astronaut needs to be able to do everything uh, aboard a, a, a spaceship for redundancy uh, reasons. If you're interested in uh, being a generalist, then an astronaut job is for you. So how long did it take then from uh, being selected to the program to your first space flight? It took a long time for, for me. Uh, Russian and American astronauts have much more frequent uh, opportunities. 
Uh, basic training probably takes about five years or so to complete. I think it was about nine years before I got my uh, first flight. And then I probably waited another nine years before I, I got my second flight as, as well. The reason for that is that when we operate as astronauts in space, we have to operate nearly flawlessly. Uh, space flight is still risky. There's things that can go wrong that we need to react to quickly and correctly. And so I make lots of mistakes in my career, and I'm proud to admit that I've made a lot of embarrassing mistakes, but all of my mistakes were made on the ground, in trainers, in simulators, rehearsing good days in space, rehearsing bad days in space, how to handle a fire in space, how to handle the depressurization uh, in space. So that when eventually I did uh, fly in space, that uh, I wasn't perfect, but uh, you know, I, I got written a lot of the uh, important mistakes out of my system. and. Uh, it, it takes special skills to operate in space, and it takes many years to, to learn. What do you think the key skills are, um, attributes of, of an astronaut? What do you need in terms of not just your sort of academic qualifications or those skills, but in terms of your personal qualities? What, what does it take to become an astronaut? Now, I think when the public thinks about the qualities of an astronaut, they think of uh, us in terms of some of the technical skills that we need to perform well in space. So the ability to do spacewalks the ability to operate uh, robotics, the ability to assemble and repair equipment, the ability to perform a spacecraft rendezvous and, and docking. Yes, absolutely. You cannot be an astronaut without mastery of those technical skills. But you are absolutely correct. Just as important, I think, are the personality traits that you need to be a, a good crew member. Uh, with Working with other people from different uh, cultures, different countries, in a closed and in a confined uh, space. So I'm talking about self-care, self-management. I'm talking about group living. I'm talking about teamwork, followership, leadership, and then cross-cultural skills as, um, as well. And at the end of my career, I will say that these personality traits are key for doing well and achieving mission objectives. And they're probably the difference between being a good astronaut and a great astronaut. A great astronaut has mastery over a lot of these personality traits that are so Im important for long duration space flight. And so I encourage young uh, students today to, yes, you know, a lot of your education is in the classrooms and the laboratories at, at a university or a college, but it's also taking part in some of the school sports, uh, student government uh, responsibilities, uh, clubs, uh, community volunteer work as well. Those are the kinds of experiences that can build up some of those personality traits that are so important for us to spend to send astronauts to space for longer and longer periods of time and to destinations further and further away. Uh, you're married and you've got you've got a family, grown family now. Um, did you have to make any sacrifices in terms, or did your family during this sort of intense training period? One of the uh, number one messages that I like to communicate to students is that if they have a, a dream, to hold on to that dream and pursue it um, with determination. And, you know, the other message is that uh, the, the way to realize a dream is to get an educational foundation uh, under the dream. You know, I think I can do anything. If I have enough training, if I have enough education, I feel as a person that I can take on any challenge that anyone's, anyone presents to me. But you're absolutely right. When you pursue a dream, there's always sacrifices to make. The ideal job doesn't fall out of the sky into your, into your lap. You don't fly in space without a lot of uh, dedication towards that, which means that you have to give up uh, other things. Um, you know, I don't say the word, words or phrase uh, work-life balance. I don't think that exists. I say work-life integration. So yes, I have a family, and obviously that's uh, my most important priority in life. But there are also demands of the space program as well. I have to be in uh, you know, the simulator at 8 o'clock of the next morning, which might mean that I, I cannot attend a school recital or a school concert. Uh, so when I do have uh, free time, I'm sure that I maximize that. So it's not work-life balance. It's work-life uh, integration as well. Yeah, there's other sacrifices uh, as well. We, we probably had to live in certain locations, certain cities that uh, would not have been... Um, you know, my first choice, but it's part of the, the space program. There's a lot of travel involved uh, to learn how to operate a, a spacecraft going to other countries, Japan, Germany, uh, Russia, the United States, Canada. 
Uh, so that travel took me away from home and is very fatiguing as, as well. But it, was it all worth it? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I realized a childhood dream. And uh, every dream involves making a sacrifice, and we have to make sure we communicate that message to young people. It's the countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. You're strapped uh, into your seat on the launch pad. What, what goes through your mind? So I know why you're asking that question. <laughs> because the space flight is risky, and one of the riskiest moments is launch. Unfortunately, I've lost some friends, uh, past astronauts, uh, during launch. And, and that's uh, tragic. I've also lost uh, friends during reentry as well. So until we can invent the the Star Trek transporter <laughs> and get off a of reliance on chemical rockets, it will continue to be a, a risky undertaking. But you have to weigh the pros and cons of this astronaut career at the moment that you're selected as as an astronaut. Once you become an astronaut, uh, the way to maximize your achievement of mission objectives and to maximize the safety of the mission you're embarking on is to focus on the task at, at hand. During launch, I have responsibilities. I need to monitor certain systems. That if I see something happening, I need to take an action uh, in order to save the mission, save our, our lives. So uh, to answer your question, during launch, I'm pretty pretty focused on the, on the task at hand. And I, I love my, uh, my family, I love my spouse, but I have to push those thoughts to the back of my mind and focus on the task at hand. Uh, so the longest period in space was that, was it six months, was it uh, International Space um, Station? Uh, during, the, I think, the Mir space station era, uh, a Russian cosmonaut spent over 400 days in, in space. So I, I believe that's the, the world record for a single mission. I have some friends, in fact, friends who I've flown with, who have flown on multiple uh, missions, and they've accumulated 800, 900 days in, in space as well. That's important because uh, what's upcoming in the next uh, couple of decades will be the first human exploration of planet Mars. So why, why, why do you think that's important? Why do you think we should spend, you know, billions and billions of dollars, um, you know, exploring uh, Mars when, you know, if we think about all the issues on Earth, whether it's um, COVID or the, the need for healthcare systems and so on, do, do you think that's a good use of money? And what are we going to get out of going to Mars? Uh, well, the first reason is uh, economic reasons. So in my country, for example, Canada, uh, taxpayers spend about $300 million per year on the space program. Our space companies, not our aerospace companies, our space companies typically have revenues of three, $4 billion a year. So the first reason is it's a, it's a money maker. Uh, the space industry is exploding and soon it will be at the $1 trillion uh, annual level. So uh, there's a lot of innovations there, a lot of commercial opportunities. Secondly, there's a lot of um, spin-offs from the space program that have provided uh, practical benefit on Earth. Canada, as you know, contributed the robotic arm to the space shuttle and also to the International Space Station. And we now have uh, a medical school, uh, my medical school at the University of Calgary, that has spun off that technology to create a microsurgical robot using the control algorithms, using the gear systems, using the vision systems uh, to perform surgery uh, on, on brains. So removing brain tumors, creating, uh, correcting um, blood vessel anomalies, removing blockages associated with hydrocephalus. Uh, and this is a, a spin-off from the space program. Uh, if there's one area of society that's particularly benefited from space spin-offs, it's the, it's the healthcare system. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, I think that the space program is inspiring to students. As I said, without a doubt, the early space program played a, a role in uh, my interest in STEM and in my uh, interest in, in innovation. And I want the same thing to happen again today for uh, today's uh, generation. And I think also that it inspires society at large to take on some of these more important challenges that you, you mentioned, um, you know, addressing uh, pandemics, addressing climate change, uh, finding a way that we can uh, create diverse society, an equitable society. If we can put people on the moon, if we can put people on Mars, then certainly we can uh, mobilize the, the world in order to attack some of these other serious social problems. And maybe the last thing I'll say, Keith, is that Mars is there beckoning for us. Uh, I, you know, humanity started on the planet Earth 
but Earth is just a cradle. And we are destined, I believe, to, to visit other destinations in our solar system and perhaps to go to other star systems in the, in the coming centuries as, as well. Earth will always be our home. We have primary responsibility to be good stewards of the planet Earth, but uh, I think it's part of our DNA, it's part of who we are as, as humans to continue to venture uh, outward and uh, explore uh, boldly. Do you think uh, there's life out there, extraterrestrial beings? Yes. Um, I think there's a very, very good chance that there is uh, other intelligent life form uh, out there. We know that in our solar system that uh, humans on Earth are the only intelligent life forms. Uh, there's a chance that there could be some um, uh, primitive uh, organisms on some of the ice moons of Jupiter or, um, or Saturn. So I think in the next decades, we will probably send robotic probes to those uh, ice moons. Enceladus is a, a, a good example of a moon. Drill down and, and potentially uh, find life there. But our galaxy is so large that um, the chances of there being an, an Earth-like kind of environment where life might have developed and might have evolved to intelligent beings, I think is very, very good. Now, no extraterrestrial, I believe, has ever visited Earth. Um, I'm very suspicious when there are news reports of extraterrestrials that have visited Earth. But I, I think that uh, in the coming centuries or maybe millennia, that humanity will be able to go out and uh, check out some of these um, other solar systems and, and see if uh, we're not alone in this universe. Being an astronaut is such uh, an incredible achievement. I think there are about 300 people only in the world who've ever been uh, into space. Uh, do you keep in touch? Do you meet up? Is there, is there a special uh, call sign? or uh, uh, tell, them, tell them how does that work, the astronaut club? You know, training for a space mission is a very intense activity. And the only way that I could get through the training and the only way that I could succeed on my duties during spaceflight was dependence on my crewmates. Um, they helped me do my job, and if an unfortunate situation were to have happened during my, my flights, I could depend on them to save my life. Uh, so you cannot go through that kind of an intense experience without developing very strong bonds of, of friendship with everyone that you fly with. Um, this past year, um, my crewmates and I from our, the, my first shuttle flight celebrated our 25th anniversary reunion together and Keith going back attending the reunion it was just like going back in in time it, we all have the same personalities we all have the same drives we all have the same sense of humor and and it's just wonderful to, to stay in, in in touch we do stay in touch at least by you know electronic uh, means as well uh, and then the same thing with my um, my space station colleagues as well uh, we get together and it's uh, it's this it's wonderful to to work together doing um you know, public outreach. And, and again, it's just like we flew together yesterday. Uh, in fact, I'll be getting together with my space station crewmates uh, this October in, in Belgium. So uh, a very tight bond. Uh, we don't have a special handshake. No, <laughs> we're pretty normal. We're pretty normal people, but we, uh, we share uh, an adventure and we all share this mutual respect uh, for each other's abilities. Uh, and finally, Bob, you know, obviously being an astronaut, literally, how do you come back down to Earth in terms of your career, your, your incredible life uh, that you have led and you're still leading all of the things you're interested in? How do you sort of not let being an astronaut define you? Well, I'll tell you a story. Uh, a couple of years ago, my wife and I had some dinner guests over at our house and one of the dinner guests asked if I had returned to normal after my last space flight. And I said, yes. And my wife jumped in and said, no, you have not returned to normal. You have not returned to Earth after your last space flight. So you know, when I responded, yes, I've returned to normal, I was talking from a physiological point of view. My heart had regained its ability to contract and my muscles had regained the strength that it had lost and bones had regained the calcium that it had lost. But my wife was talking about uh, my psychological state. And spaceflight is a professional experience, but it's also personal experiences as well. It's a life-changing experience. So quickly to answer your question, I would say that um, 
the international collaboration environment of space flight, the opportunity to look out the world, uh, out the window at, at the world and see this beautiful planet down below, to understand its ecosystem, to understand how everything in the natural ecosystem civilizations are, are all one and all connected, that has changed me. So my concerns today are less parochial. My concerns today are world poverty, overpopulation, inequality, and environmental damage. So I'm a different person today because my, my interests uh, are different maybe than they were early in my, my, my program, in my, in my training. So those are my passions today, and I am just as fervent about them as, um, you know, as, I, as I was at the beginning of the program. Yeah. That's cool. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Keith.